Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, and thank you to Kyandra. What else did I say? Uh, and thank you for the beer. It's, it's been a while since I've given a, a talk in front of an audience at a podium with a beer in my hand. So that's, that's quite exciting. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, my contribution to Visual Studio. Uh, I worked at Microsoft for about four and a half years in total. I went there as a, as a visiting researcher in, um, in 2008. And uh, that was a year contract at the end. During that time, I'd been uh, talking with lots of people around Microsoft um, about my research and looking for collaborations. Uh, my research being about visualizing networks and uh, algorithms for layout of, of these networks, mm -hmm. diagrams. And, uh, and just various interaction techniques for exploring networks visually. Um, at the end of that year, I was offered a job by the Visual Studio product group at Microsoft. Um, they, at the time, were in the process of shipping uh, Visual Studio 2010, um, which included a brand new tool for visualizing the architecture of software systems. Um, and the way it worked, I'll give you a, so this is, this is VS 2012, or 2013 actually. Um, when I, I have um, some code loaded, solution loaded, um, when I go into this architecture menu, it's, so it's, it's VS Ultimate, it's, um, it's the SKU you get if you have an MSDN license. Or if you just give Microsoft 20 grand, um, they will also in return give you this software. Um, which is quite generous. <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, okay, if I go into the architecture menu and uh, we have this generate dependency graph menu item and I go for solution, that creates a little picture of the uh, top level components in our system. So it's, it's only a small code base. Um, the code here only has uh, only has a few components. Uh, it's got it compiles down to an executable. Um, anyone guess what this program might do? <laughs> oh. um, an, a, an executable and also a DLL, a library that the executable uh, uses. Um, and both of these reference stuff in uh, this externals blob, which if I zoom into, it turns out to be um, a bunch of system level libraries. Um, the .NET platform. Okay, um, so this is, this is more or less how, how the uh, dependency visualizer looked when it shipped in 2010. Um, it was this kind of top-down exploration of the code where you could zoom into these um, these packages, components, assemblies, actually, that's what they are. Uh, inside an assembly, you find a namespace, and in inside a namespace, you find a bunch of classes. You can keep going. At this point, I guess it's pretty much like a UML class diagram, but you can keep going. And uh, inside the classes, you can see ooh, lots of methods and attributes that are being used by the class. Okay, um, so in 2010, this is more or less how it looked. Um, I spent a good year of my life when I first joined the product group um, polishing this thing like crazy, um, adding all sorts of, uh, you know, nice, nice semantic zoom um, effects and animations and smooth transitions. The reason being that in 2009, 2010, when we looked at the, um, at the way people were using this tool, we found that actually um, lots of people were interested. So, so when you when you install VS, you get an option to contribute to the um, the feedback, or I can't remember how they word it. Um, about five percent of people check that box, and we get um, we got. Why is the surface oh, cool? Uh, sorry, um, we got um, usage information, just top level. You know, they call this. They use this particular function. Um, at this time. Um, it's all de-identified de and very anonymous. Um, if you want more information, you have to go to the NSA. But um, the 
from that information, we could tell, you know, more or less what people were doing and how, whether they came back and used the tool repeatedly. And we found that they were not. Um, they were playing with it, but, and our feedback was largely positive. You know, we think this is a great tool. We're going to look at our code visually all the time. Um, but in practice, it turned out that they weren't becoming hardcore users of, of this software. And that led us to ask why, because there'd been, you know, a couple of million dollars spent on, on developing this first iteration of the, of the um, code dependency visualizer. Um, so we did loads of user studies. And as I said, the first thing we did was to, you know, run it as it is, show it to people as it is, get them to explore their code, find out what usability issues that they were having, and there were all sorts of navigation things. and. Um, so we added lots of nice little features, like for example, if you uh, hover over an edge when you zoomed in and you click on this arrow, okay, it zooms out, does this nice panning thing and takes you to the, the end of the arrow. We spent months adding all these nice UI tweaks, thinking that that would be the recipe for success for visualization. Um, because for the, the 10 years of my career prior to this time, I'd sort of operated on faith, doing my PhD and the postdoc and, and research fellowships and dozens of papers about visualizing networks um, on the assumption that of course everybody wants to see the dependencies in their code. Of course everybody wants to think about the world as a network, as a graph. Um, and what we were finding though was that maybe they don't want to think that way, at least at first. You know. um, and we would see when we saw uh, users click on, on an expander like this one here, and a whole lot of stuff pops up. Um, we'd given them some task, some problem to solve about the code. Um, they'd see something like that, and they'd go, oh my god, what happened? Ah, and they'd panic, and they'd hit Control Z, and they'd go back to what they were looking at before. Um, just because of the, the sheer overload of throwing that much information at them all in one go. So we, we decided to retask this tool to, uh, to try and really support people in the problems they were facing immediately, their immediate problems. And we looked at what developers were doing, um, what developers were spending most of their time on. And the reality for most developers out there in the real world is that they're not refactoring their code every day to, to minimize coupling and cohesion between packages. They're not, they just don't get the opportunity to do that in the real world. What they do is they debug. Um, they sit there and they try and solve little problems in existing code, which often require understanding complex chains of events through a fairly narrow slice of the code. And so that's what we, that was the scenario that we decided to support. So let's, um, let's run a little example. Okay, so I hit F5 and code runs. So, um, it's Tetris, if you hadn't figured it out already. Okay, so um, Tetris is a, is a game where you have little, for people unfamiliar with this, this advanced concept. Excuse me for a little bit, I'm having fun. Um, there is a bug in this program. And at some point, this program is going to crash. But it's the worst kind of bug where it's hard to reproduce. Um, there's no guarantee how long I'm going to be sitting here <laughs> playing this <laughs> before this bug is exhibited. Yeah, right, right. Right? Oh. <laughs> ah. oh. <laughs> yeah, OK. So, um, so it crashed. All right. So we have a null reference exception. Um, you're all .NET users, so I won't. Uh, I won't worry too much about whether or not you know what this is. OK, so it's a null reference exception. We're trying to call a method on this figure object when the figure object is null. Let me confirm that. Yeah, it's null. <coughs> we can't do that. Um, all right, so how have we gotten into this state? Well, um, at this point, at this point, I guess we could look back at the call stack and see where we came from. But, and if we're really lucky, we might go up the call stack a couple of levels and find right there a piece of suspicious code that, that does something bad. Um, oftentimes, though, you're not that lucky. And you need, to, uh, you need to step back up the code, step down into code again, place breakpoints, rerun the scenario, do a, a kind of binary search to narrow down the place in your code where, where the bug is happening. Um, so we don't have time for that right now in front of all these people. So what we're going to do instead 
is we're going to start thinking visually about this code and what might be going on. So uh, if I right click on the figure and I say show on code map, which is a feature that was added in VS 2012, and then uh, we get a little diagram. Now, um, compared to the earlier diagram, the earlier visualization I showed you, which um, which tries to take up the whole all the screen real estate to show you this this diagram, um, this one is has opened up side by side with our code editor. Um, that was a pain in the bum to get working. VS window management is is um, arcane, but. I was in the right place to find people who knew how it worked. So, um, so we did manage to tell VS to open up Windows side by side with the code editor, and that turned out to be really important. Um, the reason is that people, developers, live in the code editor. It's what they're familiar with, and, and the debugger. They like stepping through code. Um, it's their it's their primary artifact in their in their work, um, and you can't just take that away from their, their field of vision. So we place our diagram side by side and uh, have all sorts of um, visual cues as to correlating the, the, two, the two views of the, the code. Okay, um, so our picture shows us the figure, which is a parameter to this draw preview method. Um, and I guess what we have to do is find out where draw preview was called from with this null figure argument. So let's let's find all references to draw preview. I could have done that from the, the call stack as well. I could have added the call stack to this picture. Well, let's do that for the sake of argument, because sooner or later somebody always asks me if we can do that. We can do that. Uh, we can go show call stack on code map. Right, great. There's a call stack. Um, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, so that's all the way up to whatever this is. Thread start. All right. Um, so that's kind of too much information. So that's 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 why I didn't really want to do that in the first place. Okay, so let's let's go back just to the previous calling method. Um, now we've got a really little diagram. I think everybody can understand, you know, what this means. We have preview paint references with a, a call reference calls draw preview. So let's go to preview paint. Oh, that was interesting. Hmm. Okay, um, preview paint, and we see here our call to draw preview, and we see um, that the parameter, which was the first parameter to draw preview, this figure thing, um, is coming from the result of this get next figure method. So let's add that to our code map as well. Uh, at this point, I might point out that the the keyboard shortcut for this show on code map feature. It's control back tick. Control back tick. That's freaking awesome. Um, control back tick. Why is that awesome? If you look at your keyboard, it's the it's the bottom left and top left keys on your keyboard. Um, in an organization with with a thousand people all frantically adding features to, to this huge piece of software, to get those that kind of real estate is a major coup. And why nobody used it in the past, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but okay, so so. You can add uh, stuff to your diagram very easily by just moving the cursor over over the symbol and doing uh, control back tick. So let's do that. And we now have a symbol on our diagram, get next figure. And I can double click on this get next figure for a while. And OK, what happens when I double click? We navigate to the definition of the get next figure method. Um, double click. Why is that, why is that nice? Um, well, initially, when we, when we uh, added the navigate to code, the um, keyboard shortcut was the same as the um, go to definition from the code editor, which was F12, because everybody knows, everybody does that in the code editor. Um, well, yes, yes, they probably do, um, but that doesn't occur to them to press F12 on stuff in other places. Um, so, by contrast, absolutely everybody double clicks on stuff in a, in a diagram sooner or later. Um, and we, we observed that and we add that feature, and suddenly, you have a tool whether whether you believe in um, in diagrammatic reasoning or not. Um, the advantage of having a bunch of visual um, visual bookmarks 
sort of spatially arranged like this is kind of immediately obvious to people. Like, just, ooh, yeah, where was I? Um, I can go over here. Well, crazy stuff happens. <laughs> hmm. Okay, um, so, okay, so null parameter coming from uh, get next figure. Let's go to get next figure and see what it does. Right, um, so get next figure. Let's have a bit more space here. Get next figure um, is switching on this next fig thing. And depending on the value of next fig, it will return a uh, one of these things. Or null, if it can't, if it, if the next fig is not one of these values. Okay, so maybe maybe we're starting to get a clue about where this bug might be. Um, let's let's add next fig to our diagram as well. There's next fig, and let's see what that is. Um, okay, so it's a field on this class. Great. Um, better than that, let's find out all the places where next fig is referenced, and we see there are four, four places, and we see there are two different types of arrows from those methods to next fig. Um, there are dotted arrows and solid arrows. So dotted arrows, it turns out, are read-only references of this field. And solid arrows mean that the value is being changed. So all we really care about is the code that is mutating the value of this, this next fig. Um, so there are, you know, this one's just reading it. Uh, get next figure is just reading it. So there are two places. There's the Tetris grid, which is the constructor of this class. Um, so it didn't crash right away, so it's probably not the constructor. And indeed, we see that the next fig is being set to zero here, which if I uh, go back to get next figure, we see that zero is indeed handled. Um, I'm sort of deliberately navigating a whole heap um, to kind of get across the point that, that having this kind of visual um, this set of visual landmarks is actually also useful in kind of um, pair programming exercises and things like that. So oftentimes if, I don't know if people at Keandra, if you do a lot of pair programming, but um, what you often have is one person really driving and the other person struggling to keep up. Um, so, and when you navigate in code, you know, it really is, the person who's doing it knows what they're doing, but um, it, oftentimes they'll do it so quickly that, that it's really hard to keep up with. Um, if I move the mouse over something and, and click on it and let you know I'm going to do that, it's easier to keep up with. Um, okay, so it, we can do things collaboratively, collaboratively this way. Um, all right, so Tetris Grid, the constructor was safe. Um, okay, so that's not our problem. Now we can move on. I can also delete stuff from this diagram. So delete, it's gone. So I can kind of, by process of elimination, um, restrict my diagram to exactly the, the suspicious scenario. Um, okay, so um, get next figure, next fig. In it, next figure is the only suspect remaining. Let's go and have a look at that. Okay, so it's a, um, it's a, a random value seeded with zero. So actually I lied when I, I said I, I didn't know that, that there would ever crash, um, in fact, in fact, I set that seed to make sure that it would only, you know, it would crash after just a, a moment or so. Um, so it returns a, a random number in this range from zero to num figures. What is num figures? Let's, let's add that to our diagram and double click. Num figures, seven. Okay, so we're gonna have to go back and forth a few times to, uh, to see, well, somebody has a good memory and they, they're already shaking their head, but, but me, I, I can't remember what the whole uh, case statement looked like exactly. So um, I'm gonna go back to uh, get next figure and, oh, well, first let's look at, um, let's look at the you know, next figure again. So it's returning a, a random number in the range from zero to num figures. If you look at the documentation for, for random, it's not inclusive of num figures, so it's gonna be zero to six inclusive. And we'll look at get next figure. Um, okay, there's no case for six. So, um, so there are two possibilities for fixing this bug. Who can tell me how I can fix my bug? What are the two possibilities? And I'll, I'll just drink some beer while you <laughs> think about it. Reduce the upper, brand, upper bound of the random number, or have a case statement with zero. Yes, yes, very good, very good. Um, Normally people only think of the first one, 
and that makes my talk a bit more interesting. But you're on the ball, and you suggested both both possibilities. So the first possibility is um, is that uh, that number was too high. We can set that to six, and then this will not crash anymore. But there's another possibility, which this um, very astute gentleman identified, which is that uh, there's another there's another possibility, there's another possible case that's missing. So what is that case? Well, we can, uh, we can add our, well, okay, so all of these things are subclasses of this figure type. So we can add figure to our diagram. And um, you see what happened there? It took a little while for that, that arrow to appear. What it's actually doing is it's, we spent ages trying to make this really responsive and fast it's actually going away it infers by from the language services um, it gets all the the details it needs to create the initial node from the language services um, and then it goes and queries a database that we actually construct um, and uh, looks for, for all the all the connections to something that we add to the diagram. So whenever you add something to the diagram, it will go off, query this database, and look for all the connections between stuff that's already in the diagram and that thing that you've just added. Um, so you get this kind of uh, minimal but sufficient view of all the connections between the, the stuff that's been added to the diagram. Um, OK, so we've got figure, the return type of draw preview. If I hover over this edge, I think it will. Yeah, OK. Um, now. There's a whole bunch of queries that we can run from inside the code editor. For example, I can say show derived types, which might be useful. And there's a whole bunch. Um, let's let's get a slightly more compact layout for our narrow screen here. Um, okay, so who can see the bug now? Need to do a case for square. Very good. Very good. Um, how did you how did you figure that out? I've seen Tetris before. Oh. <laughs> no, I did see, no, I did see it. It confirmed my suspicion um, in the diagram. What, what was specifically? Because it's one of the derived types of figure. So that. And and how did you how did you infer that that's the one that's missing? Because um, it's it's not in the cases on the left hand side. Uh, okay. I can see that all the others are mentioned. So I can see that you know these these are actually what we're referring to in your list of derived types. Okay. And they yeah. match up in squares. Not in yeah, there's there's another visual cue actually here that oh, there's a, yeah, that's right. There's a yeah, so I think the layout here didn't do me any favors. Um, what it should have done is it should have plonked square down the bottom because it should be trying to minimize the length of these edges, and so it should have. And then then it would be more obvious that that this guy is is not connected. By the way, you can see I'm dragging these things around. That wasn't originally in the in the uh, that wasn't in the in the original version of of this visualization tool either. And, um, we made these diagrams a lot more interactive and it's possible to, um, to uh, flag for follow-up. What does that do? <laughs> it makes it red. Um, we can add a comment, which is a little node. Um, this is the missing case. No, no, we don't say that. We're nice to our, we're nice to our, our interns. I'm making out as the intern who made this mistake, but actually it's... No, anyway. Um, <laughs> this is the missing case. All right. All right. Um, so now I can uh, go to this share menu, and I can copy the image and post it into an email, or I can just say email as image or, or as a portable XPS. Who the hell uses XPS? What, what is XPS? Yeah. Um, Okay, or I can save as portable XPS, and then maybe if I can somewhere on the dark side of the internet find some tool that converts XPS to something useful, then I can, anyway. Um, or I can save it as a code map, as a, as a .dgml file. So the, there's a file format that uh, um, view dgml. Okay, so this is an XML file representing the, uh, the, the structure, the graph definition of, of this diagram. Um, okay, that's kind of useful. So you can generate these diagrams programmatically by generating the, the DGML if you want as well. Um, okay, so that's that's CodeMap, and uh, we shipped that in 2012, and 
uh, I took that opportunity to to go back to academia because as much as as much as um, fighting for certain keyboard shortcuts as much fun as that is um, I would really wanted to go back to to um, to my own research but um, this was a really interesting experience for me this this three and a half years um, with this product group learning about what it is the extra pain that you have to go to to make such a visualization tool really useful and not just an interesting uh, thing that people look at and, and kind of um, see complex looking diagrams that, that look impressive but maybe don't help them easily to answer their questions. Um, so that was that was quite gratifying and, and from all reports I've heard um, it's now or at some time when I last spoke to somebody at Microsoft it was uh, the most used feature in the Visual Studio Ultimate architecture lifecycle management tools. So there's a bunch of other ones, like drawing tools and things like that. This is the one that, that people seem to be using most, which is really, really gratifying. Okay, um, so that concludes my demonstration of, of uh, CodeMap. Um, if, you, if you have an MSDN license or $20,000, you can also try it out. Um, I might also take this opportunity to, so since I, I left Microsoft, I came back to academia. Um, I got a research fellowship at, at Monash, um, which being a, being a foreigner, I was suddenly eligible for, which is amusing. Um, anyway, so I came back to Monash and had this op great opportunity to, to um, do my, my own thing again, which is really exciting. Um, and what I've been doing, I've been all, doing all kinds of things. One thing I would like to um, spruik, if I may, um, is um, cola.js, which is a JavaScript library for doing constraint-based layout. Um, <coughs> it works really nicely with D3, if you're familiar with D3. Okay, it's not .NET, but you know, maybe we're using .NET on the server. Um, but in the browser, it's all about the JavaScript. Um, and so um, cola.js uh, allows you to make, oops, allows you to make uh, diagrams like this sort of thing. So this is a metabolic pathway where um, we have, okay, so it's similar to the kind of diagrams that we were looking at before in code maps. Um, so here there's a few things that are, are interesting. Um, we have partitioned the space into these um, rectangular regions to represent important functional pathways in, uh, in functional components of this metabolic pathway. Um, there's a, a cycle here where we've arranged the nodes involved in the cycle, the largest path through the cycle to the outside of a rectangle, um, which all of this stuff is intended to kind of achieve the same kind of layout that <coughs> biologists like to see in textbooks. This is a hand-drawn diagram um, that you will find on the, the KEG pathway database. Um, so that's how biologists like their, their diagrams to look. Um, quite structured, quite structured, um, and that's something I learned at Microsoft too from from designers was um, was the layout algorithms that we used in Visual Studio to create uh, drawings like this. They've been developed over 20, 30 years by academics and research, um, doing all sorts of things that that seemed uh, clever and, and useful at the time. Um, but when you start talking to designers, uh, they apparently really like um, nice axis aligned edges and a certain orthogonality in their diagrams. Um, and uh, you can make 3D pictures um, if you think that's useful. Um, <laughs> my PhD was all about why we should make 3D diagrams of, of graphs. So I thought at some point that it was useful. Um, um, it uh, will route the route the edges nicely to avoid crossings with uh, with other nodes, um, and uh, underlying it though is is the possibility of um, forcing certain nodes to be aligned um, with constraints that you can specify um, sort of declaratively. Um, the, the layout is really stable. I don't know if people use D3. It's a really popular package for binding um, SVG and other HTML5 visuals to 
to data. Um, it comes with some graph layout already, which is, is quite good, but um, tends to bounce around a lot. The, the layout that we have here is very stable, which allows us to explore graphs um, interactively this way, quite uh, without too much shaking about the graph, which is nice. Um, when stuff flies around your screen all the time, people, people complain. Well, first, actually, they think it's really cool, but then after a while, they, they complain. Um, OK. Um, so I think that concludes my talk for tonight. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, oh, and <laughs> um, please, please check out code maps and, uh, and cola.js. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to take your questions if we have time. Questions? Oh. In Perry, do you use the SVG to represent the graph? In, sorry? In SVG scale up. Uh, this is SVG. Yes. Okay. This, is, this is D3, generates SVG um, objects bound to, to the, the graph structure that, that cola.js is using to, is, is laying out, generating geometry for. Um, Uh, yeah, um, yep, we, um, Endepend was a, a popular one, um, and I, they were shipping, oh, interesting story, um, they were shipping around the same time that, or maybe even a little bit before, several months before VS 2010 shipped, and my colleagues, uh, who I joined at that point, were very, very annoyed that, um, that Endepend were using the layout library uh, that Microsoft Research, who I've been working with, had developed um, and were giving away for free in the, at the time. And, uh, and they were very annoyed that, um, that this competitor beat them out the gate. So Microsoft is cautious about <laughs> releasing stuff open source these days. But um, actually, it wasn't open source. It was just a, a, very, um, a very generous license that let people use this library in, in for whatever. Um, so Endepend was one. Uh, they their layout and their their um, the kind of scenarios they supported were very similar to what VS twenty ten shipped, um, which was this kind of top down exploration of, of the the graph structure. So starting at the top level components, letting you you drill down and getting more information. Um, it did a bunch of other stuff too. I can't remember the details. Um, it is cool. There are probably a few. If you do you know of some others. Oh, third-party tools. So I was, um, the first time I really got excited about having shipped something was when I saw that um, ReSharper uh, by IntelliJ, or JetBrains, JetBrains, sorry. IntelliJ is a different universe. Um, so JetBrains are this awesome Russian company who the whole time I was working at, at VS, we were like, why don't we just ship the same features that they develop, or why don't we just buy them? Um, <laughs> and rather than going to all this effort, um, and because it was this awesome plugin for, for Visual Studio that gave you a bunch of really useful refactoring tools for, for C Sharp, that was the main reason I liked it. Um, at some point, shortly after VS 2012 shipped, I saw on the JetBrains site um, a picture that looked a lot like code maps, and indeed it was code maps, and they'd, they'd written some extensions to, to the code maps, which was awesome. So yes, I believe. Um, to be honest, I've been, I haven't been following this for the last year or so. I haven't been following closely what's been going on with code map and stuff like that. Um, I don't think um, there's a lot of, I don't think there's a lot of active development on it at the moment. I've seen, uh, there was a flurry of, of new features came out shortly after I, I left Microsoft, um, adding a bunch of the stuff that we'd always sort of wanted to do, like the, visualizing the, the call stack and some debug information and things like that. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm a bit late, so I might have missed it, but is there an advantage of me using something like code map over, say, find all references in the studio? Um, yeah, you can certainly do that. But the problem is, so if I do find all references on here, I get a list. Okay, there's only two places, so that's not too bad. <coughs> Often it's quite a large list. Um, so that, that takes me back one level of one level of, of reference 
one link from where I started. Um, the idea of code map is that over time you will build up a more comprehensive picture of the structure of your code than just one level of, of indirection. And uh, that extra structure will give you clues about, um, about how things work. And so that was sort of what I was demonstrating with my with my scenario that you may have missed. Um, so yes, I believe I believe there is uh, there is a benefit to doing these things visually in this way, building up the, the larger map of, of the particular feature that you're trying to understand. <coughs>